This is Toton. It covers two square miles of Nottinghamshire. The occasional train rumbles through but it's a faint echo of the 50s, when Toton was the busiest railway marshalling yard in the world. Back then, the English Midlands were the centre of the nationalised network of British railways, and everything from coal to bananas passed through here. In the yard, they're stowing the wagons of the 448 Bristol Leeds fast freight. Fifteen sealed wagons in this train, all carrying vulnerable traffic like cigarettes, tobacco, wines, spirits, chocolates. And uh, nylons, Mrs. Smith, would be in these as well, if any were being sent. In the 50s, Britons forgot wartime rationing by going on a spending spree. And 55% of this consumer boom was delivered by rail. Massive 9F steam locos each hauled almost 1,200 tonnes of freight right across the country. With ten driving wheels, these monsters raced up to and even beyond the 50 mile an hour main line limit. You can just look back at the train and see how the guard's brake was riding, see how the wagons were riding. And if the wagons were riding all right, you'd perhaps go five or six miles over your limit. Especially if you drove an express. You'd start with a full train from Birmingham and you could take 60 wagons then all the way to Carlisle. This 200 mile trip took eight hours, in which the fireman shoveled a back breaking 15 tonnes of coal. The driver just kept his hand on the regulator and enjoyed himself. Seeing the seasons change, and seeing the scenery change, he went through different counties. He went through the Midland counties, all nice green fields till he got to about uh, Chesterfield. Then it was all pit heads and forges and foundries all the way to Leeds. And once you got through Leeds, you come into some wonderful country. All the way up to Skipton, through the Yorkshire Dales. And when you got to Settle Junction, you started to climb over the mountain. Very big long climb all the way to Bleemore. Trains with the cauliflowers, peas, cabbage, they weren't very heavy. But the clump trains, they were very, very heavy. Then across the top it went level, and when it got past Ace Gill, you were downhill all the way to Appleby, and then you was up and down all the way from Appleby to Carlisle. While Tom Wooden crossed the country, many railwomen never left the Midlands. They worked the dense network of short lines that carried BR right inside factories, breweries, and even holes in the ground. This chalk quarry at Barrington in Cambridgeshire still runs a railway.
The Ruston diesels were built in 1963, when they were already the last of the type. But old-fashioned simplicity is the key to economic survival in this harsh environment. The wagons aren't much more than buckets on wheels. In fact, the wagons free wheel the final hundred metres into the cement works, where these 15-tonne runaways are stopped with a stick. In the 50s, there was simple technology throughout the rail freight network. Coal still ruled. And most of the 200 million tonnes of coal mined each year was delivered by rail, hauled by steam locos. The six-wheeled 3F was a common sight on local lines, like this one that meandered through Nottinghamshire's coal fields. Although mainly used for shunting, a 3F could haul an entire freight train as long as it had a guard. The guard was in charge of the train. Uh, the reason that he was in charge of the train was in case there was a, a derailment or an accident, the guard had to protect the train. The guard was there because the driver needed all his concentration just to control the train. With a passenger train, you've got a continuous brake. But with these, you'd only got the brake on the engine. And these trains had loose couplings, so going downhill, the rear wagons would bump into those in front. Then going uphill, they'd all snatch apart and could even break away. There's areas where you could have a train of 62 wagons on three different gradients. So it was very, very skillful. Once again, the job was made easier by the guard, who controlled a handbrake in his van at the rear. When he was going down the down gradient, it was up to the guard to apply his brake so as to keep the wagons taut. So when he got to the end of the basin and started rising again, it stopped all this snatching and then the train didn't break in two. And that's why the guard had to learn the road. He got to know when he was on a falling gradient, he got to know when he was on the level. When he was on the level, you didn't use your brake unless you was being stopped at a signal, then you needed assistance. But other than that, you left it to the driver. Well, this special arm we're on now, it was more or less continuously in use. 24 hours a day. And you were at it all day long, up and down. Up and down all day long, shunting, quite a, quite a busy job. You come to work, it was uh, designated eight hours, but sometimes it might take you ten. Once I was at work, twenty hours and a half. So you've no food or anything. It was inconvenient, of course. There was no toilet. Uh, we kept the stove going in the winter time to keep you warm. And we used to have a, a wire around it with a, one of those steel cans on to keep the water warm, to have a drink, a cup of tea if I wanted one. But. Uh, it wasn't a lonely life because you got to be concentrating on the signalling, knowing where you was. You got coal coming from the South Yorkshire coal field as well as the local coal field, so it was very busy. In, uh, in fact, it was that busy, the major side in the same as Cholton, couldn't uh, uh, deal with the flow of traffic. They used to stand one behind each other, the freight trains did. The Midlands local lines funneled about 8,000 wagons into Toten every day. And here their locos left them. Then a shunter pushed them one by one to the brow of a small man-made hump from which each wagon could then roll downhill into the yard on its own. Hump control was the network's nerve centre. This panel, it was polished with furniture polish, wax furniture polish, and the man who operated it had a duster in his hand, and the slightest bit of dust and he'd be wiping it over. The floor was polished, and we had a, 
The paint was new, the windows obviously have a little bit smashed, but it was an absolute pristine building, it really was. These glittering lights illustrated a remarkably simple system. The trains would arrive from the collieries, and the signalman at San Diego, the box just at the top there, he would uh, let the train come into one of these rows. As it came onto this um, section here, it would show occupied. So that was a train ready for shunting. The shunters would go out of the cabin from across there and walk up, release the locomotive. And the engine would run round to the other end of the train. And the shunter would walk up with the board um, and he would chalk the wagons for the destination. Each destination had a numbered siding. Number eight was Derby. Number 22 was Acton. Number 20 was Lloyd's. There were 37, two fans. On the right hand side, it was called the West Yard. And on the left hand side, it was called the East Yard. Then when he wanted to start the shunt, he would have a switch here, shunt slow, shunt fast. And all these were various controls. And he would turn that and then the shunting engine would start to propel the train and the train would come up to the hump and the wagon would run down the hump and into the sidings. Although built in 1901, the hump was still the best way to move unpowered wagons. In actual fact, it was very, very steep. A wagon could accelerate to 25 miles an hour between the top of the hump here and the uh, points right at the bottom of the road. But the hump was only as efficient as the stick men breaking the wagons. The frequent and sometimes fatal accidents led to delays. So in 1949, British Railways replaced the stick men with hydraulic clamps on the inside of the rails. Controlled from the top of a trackside tower, these clamps slowed the wagons by squeezing the wheels that passed through them. Well, the skill was manipulating the brakes. If the road was empty, you just give a slight brake application so that it just rubbed it, and then the wagons used to run down into the yard. If the road was completely or nearly full, you give a bit more severe application, and um, that slowed the wagons down so that they just trickled inside to the various roads. Throughout the furious 50s, Toten shunted a wagon over the hump every 20 seconds. It was frowned upon if you didn't make uh, 1,250 wagons in a shift over this hump. The traffic was constant all the while, and you hear the wagons banging into the road all day. And it would be Christmas Day, Boxing Day, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. Didn't matter, Toten was always working. And on a New Year's Eve, all the drivers used to open the whistles and, would, and the whole area would chime with all the different uh, locomotive whistles. Toten couldn't close or London would have no coal, Stoke no clay, Mrs Smith no nylons. Without Toten, Britain would have shut down. Face the music and dance. Because life's a funny old game and your career may not last as long as you think, Ally Dunbar's financial plans adapt to help you face the unexpected. Let's face the music and dance. Are you all right? You look like death. You should have seen the other bloke. Ally Dunbar, for the life you don't yet know. Tomorrow. 
The Mitsubishi Charisma doesn't need an implausible plot shot by an overpaid director. The Mitsubishi Charisma. Some cars have it, some don't. Excuse me! Le Lièvre is a long-established French company. We manufacture furnishing fabrics of the highest quality. Le Lièvre and DHL work hand in hand. They carry our image worldwide. I never say no to my clients. Le Lièvre never says no. DHL never says no to me. DHL, we keep your promises. American Express, how may I help you? We've made an arrangement just for our customers. There are relevant offers on your bill. This month there's one for a garden center. Yes, we can help you with that. I've arranged a new credit card for you. It lets you spread payments over time. Or perhaps you'd prefer our charge card. Don't worry, we'll get that replacement card to you before you leave on your business trip. Would it help to change your insurance? Increase your cover. Whatever's best for you. Because we know everyone is different, we help you do more. Everybody. When British Railways was created in 1947, nationalisation was seen as industrial progress. Yes, goods wagons, Mrs Smith. Just a few of the 1,124,812 owned by British Railways, which, if they were all laid end to end, would stretch from Weymouth to Wadi Halfa. Thanks to its sprawling freight network, BR offered door-to-door -door delivery. But it had problems. Wagons would be lost for days in the huge marshalling yards. Crews from neighbouring depots distrusted each other's traditions. Locos were clapped out. Ex-fireman Dave Goulder packed his troubles into a song. Well, we're running late in the sorry state on 82.15. She's overdue for boiler work and I can't get her the steam. But with the thousand tons of coal behind and the tender full of slack, you may send me to Coventry and it just won't answer back. Well, spock in my eyes, up my head, cinders in my shoes. I'm watching a needle falling away and singing the late great blues. Now across the cab the driver sits, he's staring straight ahead He's not spoken to me for 18 months since I started at the shed He's drawn a line across the cab for each of us to stand Since he found I'd joined the NUR while he was an as left man Well, smoke in my eyes, soot in my hair, cinders in my shoes I'm watching a needle falling away and singing the late great blues now I fired a thin and piled it in, but still she wouldn't go. But when the water dropped, I forced a stop on the main line for a blow. I've smashed the clinker, cleaned the fire, tried every trick I know. But with the rake and dart, but that old fart blames me for all our woes. Smoke in my eyes, soot in my hair, cinders in my shoes. I'm a watching a needle falling away and singing the late great blues. Out of the confusion of late freight came an inspiration. BR decided to modernise and standardise. It began in 1952 with a diesel shunter, the 08. These engines would leave a depot at 6am Monday morning, go to a faraway sidings, and they'd be there till Saturday or Sunday of the following week. I mean, a steam engine used to have to go at least every eight hours for the fire to be cleaned, recalled, watered, where these that it could stay out a week without any maintenance at all. 
when you wanted uh, to mash your tea, as you see in the corner there, there's a cooker. And also you could cook your bacon and egg in the morning there. Or hot meat pies or anything like that. The 08 looked like an electric cooker because this diesel engine didn't turn any wheels. It was a generator for the individual electric motors which turned each axle, creating enormous traction. The speed of this locomotive is 15 mile an hour. But this engine was capable of moving a thousand tonne. So you see, plenty of power here. There were plenty of brakes too. The 08 had to be compatible with every wagon owned by BR. And this engine has got all the three braking systems on it. And if you include the handbrake, then that's the fourth type of brakes that's required on British Rail even today. This is one of the two air brakes. <laughs> And this is one of the two mechanical brakes. The 08 was an early triumph for diesel power. Over a thousand were made and many are still in use today. But when designing standard mainline locos, BR returned to the technology it knew best. Introduced in 1954, the 9F was a development of a 1930s loco. Typically the crews loved them, but then Tom Wooden has never even driven a car. Yeah. Where well, are we going now, Tom? How long is it since you've had a go? 30 years. 30 years. Well, are you going to have a go now, then? Yeah. Go on, then. Come on, then. 10 mile an hour. 10 mile an hour until we get up to the bridge. All right. It feels as though I've never been away from them. It feels great. Tom was a top link driver, a king of the road. His loco was the peak of British steam train engineering, and it looked as though it had been scaled at just the right time. With industrial output still soaring, BR's 251 9Fs gave capacity a welcome boost. The most famous 9F was the Evening Star, the last steam loco built for British Railways. When it was launched in 1960, slower rail freight services were facing stiff competition from trucks and even planes. BR was operating at a loss. So a plan was devised to prune the network and concentrate on the fast and lucrative mainline monsters. Between 1961 and 1963, over a thousand miles of railway lines were dug up. Often the closed services had been the local links that made BR's door-to-door -door delivery possible. But the head of BR, Dr Beeching, was a determined man. This closure is a necessary process of building up the good parts of the railway, those parts that carry nearly all the traffic now. Beeching's plan was brave and ruthless. But the road network was spreading almost as fast as the railways were shrinking. 
By 1960, both the M6 and the M1 had been built. Soon, the main lines were losing freight to the motorways. In the 60s, this was the gateway to the future, while the railways became part of the past. Barrington Village is dissected by a local goods line that connects the nearby quarry to the main line. Once a week, these sluggish 30-year-old Sentinel diesels haul a coal train through the village. It takes them 20 minutes to complete the mile-long route. Beeching must be turning in his grave. But this underused local link makes door-to-door -door delivery by rail possible. And that is what makes it economic to send the coal down the main line. And the locals like the way the coal is kept off the roads. Well, almost. In fact, only 8% of freight is delivered by rail now. A once great industry has almost disappeared. But if the motorways get clogged with juggernaut jams, perhaps rail freight will return. Well, that was the last in the series, but Classic Trains, the book, is out now in the shops, priced at £17.99. Some sunny intervals, but the north will be mostly cloudy, with patchy rain at times. It'll be quite warm in the south. That's all for me now. I'll be back at half past six tomorrow morning. Join me then if you can. Good evening. On track for comedy, Paul Shane and Stu Pollard back for a new series of Oh Dr. Beeching on BBC Scotland in 40 minutes.